The uh, book is Warfare in Antiquity. It is volume one in Hans Delbruck's History of the Art of War. The other volumes in the series are volume two, The Barbarian Invasions, volume three, Medieval Warfare, and volume four, The Dawn of Modern Warfare. So this is the Walter J. Renfro Jr. English translation. Hans Delbruck was born in 1848 died in 1929, so he lived to see the Great War. Um, this was originally, the uh, the multi-volume work was originally published as Geschichte der Kriegskunst im Rahmen der politischen Geschichte, or History of the Art of War within the Framework of Political History. Hans Delbruck um, can be seen, I guess, as a, as a point of departure. Hans Delbruck can be seen as the father of modern military history. And uh, this four-volume work is a, is a classic in the history of the art of war. And so we're going to start right away. I'm going to skip all the multiple prefaces and go right to the what he calls uh, the point of departure. The history of the art of war is a single strand in the braid of universal history and begins with the latter. It is best, however, not to begin one's investigation at the point where the first more or less recognizable events begin to emerge from the twilight of the prehistoric era, but rather at the point where the source material begins to provide a full and valid glimpse into the events. That is the period of the Persian Wars and not sooner. From that time on, however, right up to our own day, we are able to trace the development with unbroken testimony. And each successive period helps to explain the preceding one. Even for the time before the Persian Wars, there is no lack of significant testimony. For the Greeks, Homer is particularly rich, and for the Oriental peoples, such as the Egyptians, we have centuries, even thousands of years of historical sources, reaching farther back. But this evidence is still not sufficient to allow directly the formation of a completely certain picture. An historical objective analysis, based on much experience in interpreting the events of warfare, will facilitate the grouping together into a unified picture of the separate indications. This objective judgment, in its highest degree, however, is only to be attained through the study of military history itself, that is, of the latter periods. For our first steps, we must try to walk on the firmer ground that the accounts of contemporaries offer us. On and with them, the objective analysis can develop to the point of reaching clear perspectives. These perspectives, one in this way, may perhaps later be valid to cast light on the earlier period and to be brighten the half-darkness in which it is enveloped. I'm just going to pause here and, and interject after having completed the first paragraph of this four-volume work, Delbrook basically lays out his histori historiographical and historical research method perspective, and it is a particular um, view or school of thought about history, but he lays it out very clearly, um, whether one agrees or disagrees. Important here is he's talking about using our better understanding put it in simple terms uh, or straightforward terms, he's talking about using the, um, the accuracy we can get from very recent military history and using it as an analytical tool for exploring, you know, much older, um, much less clear periods of military history. Uh, he also is emphasizing this historical object of analysis, um, which is a point um, to, to, to bear in mind with respect to his view uh, and perspective on military history. Um, <clears throat> and there are a few other points just in this first paragraph uh, worth, worth of bearing in mind, but he, he clearly lays out in his very first paragraph his, his approach to history, military history, historical evidence, historical argumentation, and it's pretty, uh, pretty incredible how clearly he lays out his historical lens. So moving on, even the events of the Persian Wars have been passed down to us with uncertainty, intertwined with legends, 
not by a real contemporary writer, but written down only as they came from the mouths of the following generation. So that a Niebuhr, despaired of recognizing their special sequence, and whenever, despite his warning, historians time and again present to us all the details of Herodotus's account of history, a great deal of self-deception is involved. No matter how skeptical a position one might wish to assume, however, with respect to the colorful accounts of the father of written history, they do contain a nucleus of accuracy that is sufficient for the purposes of a history of the art of war. We recognize the combat methods of the two armies. We can establish the terrain on which the fighting took place, and we can understand the strategic situation. With these things, the basic features of the military action are established, and these features in turn provide a very reliable critical measure for the details of the legendary accounts. No older military happenings are laid out before us so clearly. The Persian Wars, therefore, form the natural point of departure for a history of the art of war. It's just interesting in, in this paragraph uh, when he says, we recognize the combat methods, methods of the two armies, we can establish the terrain on which the fighting took place, and we can understand the strategic situation. Here's the, again, the, the father of modern military history writing a uh, historic uh, study of the history of the art of war in, in basically what for him was world history. And in that one sentence, he kind of lays out the basic fundamentals of a war game. If you take out I guess some some as some game aspects, um, recognizing the combat methods of the two armies. So how, in back to a war game on the tabletop, how do we make uh, pieces of cardboard behave like Persian infantry, Macedonian phalanxes, light infantry, heavy cavalry, and so forth? Um, combat methods. How how do these pieces of cardboard fight, how do they interact with other uh, types of units. And we can establish the terrain on which the fighting took place. So how do we represent that battlefield in all the different ways from uh, terrain effects charts to, you know, to um, hexes, even a simple hex grid. Um, and then we can understand the strategic situation. Um, just as a general commentary, I think uh, war games do this less well than the first two, the combat methods and the terrain. Um, the strategic situation could be dealt with uh, better in our games. What are, what are the commanders on each side of the battle trying to achieve? What do they feel they have to achieve? What do they feel they must protect? What do they feel they must um, destroy in the enemy force? I mean, the first point, of course, is that it comes down down to what is reflected in the, in the victory points and victory determination. But that's just that's just part of it. Um, the strategic situation. And by the way, Hans Delbruck writing in this time, um, we could probably say the operational and strategic situation. Um, but yeah, where, where does the battle take place within a larger campaign, and what does that have to do with with, with what happens on that particular battlefield at that particular time of the battle being, being um, represented. Um, and so that, uh, I'm just going to pause there for this first step in, in what uh, Hans Delbert presents as a long journey through, again, pretty much world, um, or certainly Western, uh, Western uh, history and in particular, the history of the art of war. This is a great, obviously, I consider this a great um, work. And it, if there's one work that can kind of um, underlay wargaming in general, uh, this is certainly one candidate. Um, I guess that's a good, good discussion topic. What are the best readings as a background to, to wargaming in general? But I certainly consider this to be um, a candidate for a, a top five list. And so this was just the, the first step in Warfare in Antiquity, Volume 1 of Hans Delbruck's History of the Art of War.